afternoon. The whole team was ejected. Uh, well, thank you all very much uh, for. You have to tell me about that tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I want to. I'm I'm filibustering uh, to uh, get our crowd seated. And first, let me say how wonderful it is to see all of you here today. So, uh, I think uh, it's a real pleasure to have this conversation. Uh, it really has been organized by Anya Schifrin, so you should start us off. Oh, thank you so much, Merit. So um, I'm really happy to see so many students here. In our classes, we have been studying um, digital regulation now for many, many years at SEPA. People like Alexis Wachowski and Peter Mychek and I have been teaching about uh, tech governance for, for more than a decade. And um, you can imagine how overjoyed I was when Merit Jano, before she stepped down as Dean of SEPA, said to me that she had a little bit of grant money left from the Nigelo Rodin Global Future Policy Futures Forum, and did I want to help organize something? Um, and I said, you bet. Fantastic. Let's bring together regulators from all over the world. And Columbia World Projects um, stepped in with a very large grant to make this happen. And we really spent Anna Marchese and I and um, Ron Casimir's predecessor basically started working the phones almost a year ago, where we started to think, what are the key subjects that we should be covering at this conference? And who around the world is an expert? So I'm sure many people, we have Dr. Ackerbach here, who's the president of the High Audiovisual Authority from Morocco. We have Pak Usman here, who's bringing the Australian News Media Bargaining Code to Indonesia. We have Rod Sims, the former competition chair from Australia. We have a slew of regular and civil society and academics from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And I'm sure many people were surprised that they suddenly got this call from Colombia to come. Um, there were many more who couldn't get visas from Uganda and Kenya and, and other countries. But it was really because of Anna and I spending so much time talking about you know, what are the key questions right now that are confronting regulators? What is it going to take to spread some of their ideas around the world? And what are the questions we should be asking ourselves? And those of you who um, take my classes know that we talk a lot about does Europe's Digital Services Act actually make sense in Africa? Can you adapt it to Latin America? Michael Markovitz and Harry Dugmore are here from South Africa and Australia, so is Justine Limpet Law. Um, should, you know, what does the new digital digital markets um, regulations in Europe mean for the rest of the world? Is America behind? You know, Brazil, Felipe Seligman is here. We have Justice Barroso from the Brazilian Supreme Court. They're looking now at some of their tech regulation, problems of mis- and disinformation. So there's a lot of questions all around the world that people are talking about. Many of you know we've been talking in our classes and writing since the fall of 2020 about the Australian News Media Bargaining Code. So these are all key questions that we've been exploring at SEPA for years now. And the chance, the you know, the fun Funding from, from the Nigelo Rodin and from the Columbia World Projects and all of the intellectual support that we've had has meant that we can finally actually come together. And we're hoping that this will really be the first step in a lot of the convenings and policy work that Columbia World Projects is starting to plan. Um, and a very nice rounding off of some of what you're doing. So just to say, I'm very grateful that you're all here. This is ongoing work. Um, a little shout out to Audrey Hatfield and Raghavi Sharma and others who really help put this all together. And Merit, I think you're going to introduce the panelists and then talk about um, the, the key. Com this panel is mostly going to be about competition and the new report, as I understand it, from the Center for European Regulation. So sorry that was so long. A little context. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, um, really, my, my welcome to all of you. Uh, I am Merit Jano, Dean Emerita, I'm professor here. And this is a conversation on regulating big tech lessons from around the world. We have a great panel uh, discussing, I think, issues of really global economic significance and really ongoing debate and change. Uh, I'm hoping that we're going to ask some hard questions, unanswered questions uh, that matter for the future. I do want to thank again Anya and also the um, Columbia World Projects um, for taking uh, this forward as a um, 
2023 Nijilo Roden Global Digital Futures Policy Forum. It's been going for a number of years and really uh, uh, bringing together um, academics, regulators, experts, thinking about the digital economy in a global context uh, in a very interdisciplinary setting. So we often are talking and looking at, at security issues, cybersecurity, uh, also economics, technology, and, and politics. So we have you know, four amazing people who've been involved in different ways and for a long time. Uh, let me start with Dr. Uh, Bruno Leibberg, who is the founder and director general of the Center on Regulation in Europe. Of course, our own Joseph Stiglitz, university professor, Nobel laureate, professor at SIPA and the Business School. Eleanor Fox, who's the Walter Derenberg Professor of Trade Regulation Emerita at NYU, and one of America's really leading experts on US and global antitrust. I would note that as you spoke about convening global regulators, we did that together once in 1997 uh, for the antitrust division of the US Justice Department for the first time bringing together global uh, regulators to talk about where the US and Europe and the world was in friction uh, and harmony. Um, still feels uh, timely. Uh, and Rod Sims, now Professor of Public Policy um, at Australian National University, where we have many ties, former chair of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, who's just received a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for his contributions to antitrust. Congratulations, Rod. So tech giants have been born in the U.S., but operate globally, and at least for the last two decades um, in the U.S. and Europe, we, and all over the world, we've been assessing their business activities, their impact on innovation environments, and their broader societal effects. And responses have differed across countries, and I think we're still um, at a stage of assessing impacts and managing frictions and thinking about new ways of cooperating uh, and regulating conduct. You know, Europe is often the first out of the box on regulatory approaches, uh, I think, um, and sometimes is more inclined to regulate uh, ex ante, while the US is, uh, regulates often more ex post. Uh, and I think that's also true around data governance and the digital economy. Uh, the DMA, the Digital Markets Act, um, is a really significant piece of law that entered into force in November and will apply from, I think, May 1, um, you know, which has designations as to who are subject to the act uh, coming out later this year, uh, and expectations of compliance expected as soon as March 2024. So this is something very immediate and looming. Um, other jurisdictions often follow the EU or are influenced by the EU. Uh, GDPR has been probably a very visible example of that. Uh, but, you know, Europe is not alone in influencing the world. The U.S. has also, and, and Australia is beginning to in some important areas as well. I'm sure you'll talk about that. So understanding how the U.S. Uh, and Europe looking, look at certain conduct and certain conditions of digital giants, I think, is what this panel uh, uh, will uh, help us think about. It's highly consequential and approaches um, are evolving. So I thought, uh, 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 you know, Bruno has, has uh, been the co-chair of an important report that has just come out. So if you, you uh, I thought we start with you, if you don't mind. Um, uh, speak to your overall conclusions and the focus, which is really on the governance of the digital ecosystem. But then I thought we might invite us all to talk about the harms, what you each perceive to be, what are the harms associated with digital platforms that might warrant new approaches and uh, uh, regulatory models, as well as the benefits, and where are the major areas of tension and harmony? So, starting over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. 
Thank you, Merit, and, and thank you, Anya, uh, for, for the invitation. Um, it's, it's an honor to, to be here in, in Colombia, and so it was a pleasure also. Uh, and uh, um, I, I, I wanted to, I would like to start, I think you, you gave me 10 minutes, so I, I, I would like perhaps to, to tell you where I come from when I think about uh, uh, regulation of, of, of telecoms, regulation of digital. I, in fact, in the, in, in, in the late 80s, uh, I, I had the chance to work with the, the president of the European Commission at the time, uh, Jacques Delors, who was a visionary, uh, and, and my task was to uh, liberalize telecoms markets in, in Europe because that was uh, indispensable to, uh, to integrate the markets. So we, we needed to get rid of, of, of monopolies. And, and that's when this body of, of regulation started in, in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, then we, we come to the, the, the so-called digital age. My understand, or my first um, experience with the digital uh, age is John Perry Barlow. You know, 1996, the declaration on the independence of the, of the cyberspace. And at the time, you know, we were not, we were talking about a world which would be free, no rules, no government involvement, nothing like that. And we went on, the internet developed and at some stage, people realized that it couldn't continue like that, and regulation had to come in. States decided that they wanted to get back control. It happened that Europe was the first one to, uh, to do that. Uh, if you think that, for instance, the e-commerce regulation dates from 1999, already 23 years ago. Uh, 24 years ago, uh, and, and then we, the point is that uh, regulation started to emerge in various parts of the world, and of course, when you think about regulation, regulation, I would say, is the, is the result, or is, is very much impacted by two kinds of drivers. The first one is the economic interest of, of, those, uh, of, of those states which enact those regulations. But the other are the collective preferences that each region, each country will have. And we call them values. And we may very well share some, for instance, between Europe and the United States, we may share similar values we may not always share similar economic interests. And then we, 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 we realized, uh, in fact, two years ago, that all the benefits of the, uh, of the digital developments, and when I talk about the benefits, I'm talking about benefits which, which are both for, for citizens, for, for users, for consumers, for societies uh, were being hindered by a process of various regulatory developments taking place in various parts of the world, but which would not necessarily converge precisely because <coughs> of different values, different sets of interests. And this led to uh, uh, the realization that, of course, if we if this convergence of, of rules, uh, which is hindering the, the, the global process, uh, is uh, taken to the, to the extreme, uh, is, is being hindered, you, you will have, and that's what we see today, uh, a phenomenon, a phenomenon of, of fragmentation, of fragmentation of, of the global uh, uh, digital ecosystems. And that's when we decided uh, a year and a half ago uh, to come up with a project uh, which uh, is called Global Governance for the Digital Ecosystems. Uh, and uh, basically the subtitle of the, the first report which was uh, issued last November sums up well 
what we are up to. It's called preserve convergence when it's possible, but when it's not possible, try to organize coexistence. Coexistence between systems which are not necessarily the same, and, and that's how we uh, assembled a team of 30, some 30 uh, uh, researchers from the US, from Europe, from China, from Brazil, with a view to, try to, to identify in four areas what were the similarities and the divergences uh, between uh, regulation on data, on platform regulation, on uh, infrastructure resilience, and on digital trade. And, and we came up with a, um, with a set of, uh, of uh, recommendations. There are some 50 of them. We had a, a, a fantastic uh, steering committee uh, with brilliant people like uh, Merit, uh, who was there, uh, and, and who, who, who guided us. Uh, and and I, as, as you said, I, I, we, we did this, uh, I collect this with, uh, with Pascal Lamy. Uh, and we, we organized our, uh, our recommendations around four work streams, uh, sorry, around four, four policy objectives. Efficiency, compatibility, and that includes interoperability of rules, resilience, and coherence. And among, I, I won't go into the detail of the recommendations, but among the recommendations, there's, there's some which are very specific to each of the areas. And there, there's one which is overarching, which is to set up uh, a so-called global digital board. And that would be a body which is a bit modeled on the financial stability board which was set up by the G20 uh, after the 2008 uh, um, crisis, uh, and which would be a multi-stakeholder uh, forum with representatives from governments, from the agencies, uh, from, uh, the, from the industry, from NGOs, etc., and think tanks, of course. Uh, we have to protect our, our own interests. <laughs> uh, and and uh, we, we think that, uh, and, and this is now, we, we are discussing this uh, with a number of countries, one of my the reasons for, for me being here uh, this week is, is, is also um, just coming from Washington, discussing with, with, mem with people from, from the Congress and the administration. Uh, in Europe, there is big support for that. We are also uh, discussing with the uh, G20 uh, presidency, which is currently held by India uh, and the, the, the G7. But basically, what we would like, and I will, I will close here because I think my time is up, uh, is that we, we think that clearly uh, if we want to make some step, some progress towards organizing coexistence and promoting convergence, we have to do it clearly first between the US, the EU, Australia, Japan, a number of so-called like-minded countries. However, we think that it is very important to, to have in the conversation also, those countries uh, called the globals from the global south, uh, and I'm thinking of uh, India, I'm thinking of Brazil, I'm thinking of South Africa, Indonesia, you know, more than two billion people on this, uh, on this planet. Uh, and I think it's important to get them in the conversation. Uh, personally, I was very much uh, shocked when I saw, and you will say that th there is no relationship, but I think there is. I saw uh, at the UN last year and last month when uh, there were resolutions on the condemning the, the Russian aggression uh, uh, invasion of, of, of uh, Ukraine. You could see that, of course, there were some 140 countries which supported uh, the uh, the resolution and just five or s now seven 
who, who, who voted against. But what I'm more concerned about uh, is, is the, the set of 35 and now 32 countries who abstained. And I'm less, less uh, worried about China because this is a, sp a specific situation but then, then the countries I, I mentioned. And that's why I think, and, and I would like to conclude here, I think it's important that in this exercise of trying to move towards a coexistence uh, in the regulatory framework all over the world for, for the digital ecosystems, uh, we, we, we try to, to have uh, around us, around Europe, the United States, etc. That, that we have those countries as well. Because I think uh, that tech regulation, the regulation of tech today and in the years to, to come is gonna be a structuring element of the new international order. And therefore, I think it's, it's very important that we try to extend this conversation as widely as possible. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. That's a great start. I, I, I think I'm hearing already um, you've, you've prompted an applause. We may, we may have a round of uh, Q&A here and, and then we'll open it up for questions. But I think you've, you've prompted us already with uh, uh, a perspective on regulation of the digital ecosystem. Um, but I think we're also going to talk about the regulation of digital platforms and uh, which is um, only part of that ecosystem. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and one way into that is, is asking ourselves, uh, you know, what are the harms associated with these platforms that we should care about? And are we thinking about it similarly across the world or differently? Maybe it's being felt differently. Maybe it's or maybe we choose as different countries with, as you said, preferences uh, reflected in regulatory approaches to reach things differently. Uh, Joe, could you take a spit into that? Yeah, um, you know, I, I would begin by saying, how long do we have uh, well, uh, to talk you know, about I, the harms? I, no, no, I, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> I, I, I just want to emphasize, I think there are, uh, uh, we have a lot of harms. So I'll just be very quick. Um, so. Uh, obviously, given this panel, competition, the lack of competition, is a real concern, and it spills over from um, uh, lack of competition in the platforms into uh, lack of competition in the product markets that go over the platforms. So uh, the lack of competition in one place has consequences uh, for others. Um, the way the platforms take on information and reinforce their market power also undermines the fundamental uh, uh, principles of a free mark of, of market economies where what makes for efficiency of markets is that everybody faces the same prices and they engage in price discrimination um, violation in the US of Robinson Patman Act but that hasn't been enforced for 50 years um, but the point is it enables them to extract consumer surplus out of individuals, and the success then is not based on greater efficiency, but greater ability to extract uh, consumer surplus. So it really undermines the efficiency of the market economy. Then there are issues uh, of privacy and so surveillance, where, where issues of values come in uh, very, important, very importantly. Um, you know, I think the Chinese government likes the ability to have surveillance. I think we feel a little bit of queasy uh, about that. And then there are all, all the issues related to mis- and disinformation that go over uh, the platforms, um, including those uh, related to incitement, hate speech, political intervention, um, the health consequences of spreading misinformation about the vaccines put, threatens everybody in our society. And then I'll just mention two more. Um, one of them is, um, we, you know, uh, you talked about regulation, deregulation. One view I have is every system has a regulatory system, so the use of deregulation is really not really the right framework. It's which regulatory structure. And for instance, in 1995, the United States, we decided 
that the platforms could spread mis and disinformation without accountability differently from the treatment of ordinary uh, publications. And, and that issue, some aspects of that issue are now before the Supreme Court. Uh, but that's an aspect of, of the ability to do things there that you can't do uh, elsewhere. And finally, uh, a concern is uh, the ability uh, to avoid taxes uh, and the whole issue of digital taxation uh, and how they are undermining uh, revenue streams in developing countries and many other countries. Uh, and so, uh, well, okay, let me just stop there. Those are a lot of harms. Um, uh, <laughs> I didn't finish, but I. I, I <laughs> well, the question of you know how many of those are ripe for reaching and who's responsible for ameliorating them is also maybe something that can come out in the course of of our discussion. May I ask the same question of Rod and Eleanor, starting with perhaps Rod? Look, thanks very much, and. Uh, uh, Thanks very much for the invitation to be here, especially and you who went to a lot of trouble to transport me 10,000 miles to be here, so <laughs> much appreciated. Um, I guess one thing I found uh, in, in the report, which I very much enjoyed reading, uh, took me a long time actually, it was a long report, uh, but it didn't mention market power. I don't think I saw market power mentioned at all and I was just wondering how you can approach the digital issues without that issue. So while I very much got a lot out of it and enjoyed it in many ways, uh, I think it, it did miss a bit on market power and then that means that, you know, the, the you know, if you talk about regulation of the digital area, you've got to have some sense of what the harms are and um, Joe's covered them, but just my succinct way is you've got, um, uh, you know, complete monopoly in ad tech which pushes up the price of digital advertising. You've got a duopoly in apps and that pushes up prices there. Uh, you've got a lack of choice of service. Uh, you've got um, stifling of innovation. I mean, to some extent, people talk about regulation. Oh, we don't want regulation that damages innovation. No, no, part of the regulation that's happening worldwide is to promote innovation. And I think it'll do more to promote innovation than uh, just leaving it uh, uh, run its own course. And um, so I think, of course, there's difficulties with regulation, but if we let the harms continue without being addressed, then there's difficulties there as well. Now, if I look at who's doing what, and I heard Merritt's introduction, I mean, my sense looking from a long way away is that it's very hard for the US to regulate the platforms. They're just too powerful in the United States. They're not as powerful elsewhere. Uh, when we introduce the news media bargaining code in Australia, which is tomorrow's topic, not tonight's. Um, we had all sorts of threats from Google and Facebook, but they completely overshot, drew a, com a strong negative reaction from the population, and they eventually had to back down because they saw that. Um, uh, so they're a very powerful position in the US, which I think when you talk about comparative approaches to regulation, well, it's just harder in the US. The second observation I'd make is that, and Mer Merit, you mentioned the European desire to get into regulation. I, I agree with that. But I think we have to keep in mind here that the European Commission has been taking antitrust cases um, for some time against the platforms, and the US has not. So the US did not use antitrust law. Uh, uh, the European Commission did. It was successful and it didn't change a thing. I mean, it raised a lot of money. I mean, it was a real money spinner. You want to talk about taxation. I mean, they've paid enormous fines, billions of dollars, um, uh, but it hasn't changed behaviour, I would argue, at all. So the European Commission said, well, we, we, we tried that. We tried antitrust. And uh, the DMA is basically... I mean, all the DMA does is it takes the... the, the um, violations, uh, the, the, the alleged violations of antitrust law, and says 
you, you just can't do that anymore, <laughs> right? It, it just it make, almost makes it per se, you, you can't do it. And so it's, it, it, its explanation is, well, look, we tried antitrust, it's slow, it didn't work, so we're now going to try regulation and just prohibit all these things and see whether that has an effect. So the Europeans did try antitrust. Now, I was at a conference, which Eleanor was at as well, uh, where someone from the US was saying, well, the US is now trying antitrust. Well, they are, with Lena Khan and Jonathan Cantor. There is now an, an attempt to use antitrust. And the, the statement from the US person was, well, why don't we wait and see how the antitrust goes? Well, look, that's all very fine, but you can't blame the Europeans. They tried antitrust. In their view, it didn't work. They've moved to regulation. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's interesting when you've got issues like digital platforms. You know, you can think about how you deal with things in, in, in different ways. I mean, antitrust law, it's there, it gets determined and it evolves by courts. And that's fine. But there's nothing wrong with governments doing stuff as well, right? I mean, the, the Sherman Act is, is regulation, right? It was a, a law brought in by a parliament. So you, you, you just don't have to think that the only way you make laws is to evolve antitrust through, through the courts. You could just have the parliament make laws, which is what's done in many countries. I, I just thought, I'd just talk a bit about convergence and that, the, I mean, you talk about values and I, I accept that. But from an outsider's perspective, looking at the US, one of the values the US places very highly is freedom of speech. And it does so to such a point that there's less concern about disinformation, which I would argue, looking from outside of the US, is doing the US a lot of harm. I see disinformation everywhere. I see a, a disengagement. I see a, damp a threat to democracy. And I think that's got a lot to do with a number of things which is a topic for another day, I won't, but um, uh, I think disinformation's causing a lot of the problems. So, you know, whereas I agree that the limited liability of the platforms for what is shown on their platforms was great and got them started, I think that now has to be under, under question because I think the disinformation is causing way more harm than the competition yeah, harms yeah. and damaging our societies and could indeed bring our societies down. So. I think you won't get convergence um, on uh, privacy issues because the rest of the world won't adopt a US standard, never will. Certainly Australia never would, um, and I, the Europeans won't either. Um, I guess the only other thing I'd say is where I'm concerned a bit about um, and, uh, digital regulation is we've got a lot of different approaches being taken. You've got the competition regulators, consumer, um, you've got the disinformation issues, um, you, you've got electronic safety, there's many aspects and so I think it probably is useful for people within a country to get together to try and bring more cohesion to how we deal with digital platforms. If we just deal with them in silos within a country, I don't think we'll achieve what we should be achieving. So I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's a wonderful segue uh, to, uh, to Eleanor, um, you know, who uh, I, I know has thought a lot about, uh, about the harms and, and, uh, and also, um, you know, could give us a perspective on where U.S. antitrust is today because I think the, uh, the uh, you know, the antitrust uh, Regulators, if you will, those are, are are not where the courts are, and so there's a there's a, a to to take your point, and so if we talk about where the future of the regulation of the digital economy and, and particularly platforms might be in the United States, it's sometimes hard to answer that question because we are a little bit at war with ourselves. It seems. I wonder if you share that perspective. Yes. So, so first of all, thank you very much. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Merit. And, and thanks to my colleagues on the platform. Um, yes, I spend a lot of time thinking about, the, about big tech and the digital economy, and I spend a lot of time thinking about the issue Merit just put her finger on, which I'll come back to in a minute, but it is about what I will call a real ideological war in the United States in the antitrust field, that means 
when antitrust can be invoked to control power. There's a huge ideological debate. On the one side, I would call it libertarian, saying, what power? We don't see the power. I mean, we think these companies are great. They've given us things that we never could have imagined, um, made great progress, leave them alone to keep innovating. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, people say, yes, I see the power. I feel the power. These big tech firms are taking over my mind. Um, so this ideological debate is happening in the United States and the libertarian side has the, the major cards in the deck because of our Supreme Court, uh, which hands down very libertarian-leaning decisions. Um, so I want to cover really quickly three points. Um, Merritt wants us to talk about what harms, and I want to talk about what harms in a very almost traditional antitrust competition related way. Number two, does antitrust reach the harms? And then you get into this huge ideological debate in the United States. And then number three, um, the ideas that Bruno started us out with about convergence and if not organizing coexistence, um, this invokes the fact that most countries in the world see the harms from big tech and are working hard to have some system of law that is antitrust-like but extends antitrust to control the power of big tech, and U.S. isn't there. Okay, so what harms? Let me put harms that are very antitrust-related into three categories. Um, the first category is the following, and this is against the backdrop where do have in your mind the GAFA, the uh, Google, uh, Apple, uh, Facebook, now Meta, and Amazon. And then there are one or two others, definitely. The GAFA is not quite limited to four, but there's Microsoft and Netscape and a couple of others that I would include in that. And what are they doing that has gotten the attention of so many people in the population to say, this is power and it's got to be controlled and antitrust is a good tool? So three categories. One category is most traditional antitrust where these GAFA firms have tried to make it very hard for any other system to interoperate with them um, so that this builds a moat around each ecosystem, makes it hard for competition to get in, um, and keeps the market power. That's interoperability and data portability, because if you can port your data to another system that is competing, uh, say with Google, Facebook, Apple, um, that makes for competition. Other suppliers, maybe new ones, maybe even the big older ones, can compete for your business, and that makes for a more dynamic market. So this first point is very traditional antitrust, and we call it interbrand competition, that each one of the big tech firms have been, although some of them have been disciplined against it by EU, but they have been trying to build moats around them to hold their power. The second is their conduct on their own platforms some of it I call um, predatory conduct on the platform, and I'll just give you one example, which you may know, and there are a whole lot of examples. Um, when Facebook was confronted with the fact that new young startup Vine was making really short videos and getting them out to its users who would send them to the friends, and, as, and, and Vine had just started using the Facebook platform as its business. And of course, all of the GAFA invite outsiders to use their platform. That's one of what they hold themselves out of doing. So Vine has this great idea. Facebook can see that Vine has a great idea that might be challenging it. So it and Zuckerberg himself said, cut them off, cut off their data. So that's sort of squeezing on the platform a, a more modest but maybe troublesome 
um, kind of conduct is self-preferencing on the platform, which Google has done, because Google goes into business with the rivals on its platform. It takes their ideas. It demotes others who are in the same line of business on the platform. The third category I want to mention relates almost entirely to data. And data, of course, is one of the huge elements that gives these companies power. And this is a new kind of power since big tech grew up. Um, what we witnessed was the big tech says they're giving you things free, but they're taking a lot of your data and cultivating it and selling it to the advertisers and, and the advertisers and they, but mostly they, are making huge amounts of money from your data. There are questions of deception here, which I'm not mentioning because they take it to you, from you without consent. Um, but this third category is a kind of different question about whether um, startups new entrants in the field should have access to some of the data that the big tech is accumulating um, in order to be able to compete. So you can see the first two categories were stop them from doing things that's undermining competition and this data category is saying something like the following. These companies are essential facilities. They have the data and, and the data is an essential facility. They have the data that's necessary to compete. If they can keep taking it from you and using it only for themselves, um, they build a bigger moat. Okay, so those are three time, kinds of harms. Does antitrust reach it? Most of the world says it reaches all three categories. United States, because of our very conservative Supreme Court, does reach the first category. If you find big competitors that have agreed with one another uh, that they're not going to let their customers um, move over to another supplier, that's a real red flag. The hitch here that libertarian-minded people will raise is the argument of um, Apple has a walled garden and Apple says, because we have a walled garden, the walled garden really means we're not trying to let the competition in. We're trying to build the moat. And Apple says, we're doing it because we can give a better service and because we need it for security. So that's a kind of innovation idea. That has a lot of traction in the US courts. Um, so in the US, there's a very interesting thing happening because our enforcers in the Biden administration do see the power, do want to control the power, and they're trying, as, as Merritt indicated. Um, they're bringing cases. Some of those cases were started under the Trump administration, incidentally, um, but the new Biden administrators are very, very serious about trying to control the big tech firm power. Um, they've brought some cases good cases, they read well, their research was good. Um, they run into, I'll just give you one example of what they run into. Um, ah, my example, I'm sorry. The example is uh, the kind of law they run into because it's epic against Apple. It's a private case where the court um, dealing with the fact that Apple it charges game developers a 30% premium um, if the users of the games want to get the premium products, the kind that are no longer free, but they're going to pay for it. Apple takes a 30% tax off the top, and that's because Apple says everybody has to go through the Apple Play Store. You can't get to um, Epic Fortnite without going through the Apple Play Store, and then we tax you 30%. Um, so Epic brought a case against Apple. And Apple tries to defend its walled garden, saying this is necessary for security. Um, the point I was going to make was when the case gets adjudicated before the court, it gets adjudicated under a statute which is called the Sherman Act, Section 2, which says you may not monopolize. This is our statute that controls the power that is a single firm act, not a conspiracy. Like, not saying Apple's in conspiracy, but that Apple itself has all this monopoly power. And the court said, well, I just can't find 
the apple is a monopolist. It's just below 50%. It doesn't pass the 50% line. So I'm sorry, there's just, we don't even go to the next step to consider how anti-competitive its act is. Um, so that is just an example of the difficulty of reaching these, this conduct under the U.S. antitrust law. Our agencies are trying. Also, others and they are trying to get legislation that will make the law more um, able to handle conduct. The legislation, you might have noticed, like Amy Klobuchar has introduced a lot of the legislation. She has really tried to push it. She's even gotten some uh, bipartisan support for the legislation, um, be, mostly because the Republican side were very worried about content moderation of conservative views. Um, but they signed, some of them signed onto these bills, but they didn't have traction. They'll probably be introduced in the next session. I wouldn't bet on it. Thank you. Uh, so, 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 yeah, so, so we just have you as, as odd person out. We can talk later about convergence. Sorry. Yes, let's turn next to convergence, but thank you very much. That's a fantastic perspective on, on what's happening in the United States, and I think you You've uh, outlined the harms and also the regulatory impulses here, which uh, I, I also think that the um, legislation, which is focusing on self-preferencing as a harm, seems to have the most bipartisan support uh, and may come back. Now, I know that, Bruno, you, you, you wanted to respond to the invitation on harms <clears throat> and other things. Yes, on, on, on the issue of harms, perhaps two, two, two very briefly, two sets of uh, <clears throat> remarks on, on, economic regula on, on, on the economic harms and then the, w what I would call the more, uh, the, let's call them the non-economic uh, harms. And, and I, the, the, it's clear that uh, what we see from, the economic, from an economic perspective is, 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 a, is an unfair balance of power between, on the one hand, those big platforms that we, in Europe, we call the gatekeepers uh, and uh, the the, uh, the business and, and, and platform users, and 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 basically the harms that, uh, for instance, the the piece on the digital market, the digital markets act, tries to uh, uh, respond to are uh, the lack of contestability, uh, the lack of choice, uh, and uh, too little uh, competition in markets. I heard you, Joe, uh, very recently talking about uh, natural oligopolies, and and I think this is this is really a, a good way to, to depict the what we're not talking about monopolies, stricto strict sensu. But I think we are, and, and I'm talking about. I like that because, as I said, I'm coming from the world of you know regulating the utilities, regulating the the energy, regulating mm -hmm. the, the telco. So here we need to, 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 to address this differently and, and I think that that's what the DMA is, is trying to do uh, in Europe. Then the, the issue of uh, the, the other arms, the non-economic arms. Uh, I, I think that regarding first the, the, the harmful content, I think there's a basic principle that uh, we're trying now in Europe to, to implement, which is that everything which is not acceptable offline should not be acceptable online. And, and, and this is a very basic phenomenon, basic uh, statement, which is, 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 is we are still very far from being able to implement it. But, but uh, uh, I, I, I wanted to make that point. The, the, the other harms, we, we haven't talked yet about them, but it's, it's the addiction. You know, we, we talk, this is a, a major phenomenon which is, uh, which is affecting uh, the uh, uh, young people and the less young people as well. Um, I very often look at my, my mobile. Uh, uh, so, and, and, and then there, there are a number of, of, of social issues uh, related uh, with, with platforms, and this is, of course, the major uh, topic of, uh, of child safety, uh, online stuff. Uh, so basically, the, the, the harms there which need to be responded to uh, are, uh, are harms which require an increased protection for, 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 for users, for citizens. Uh, and, and that's what the... Uh, the DSA, the Digital Services Act, 
is uh, aiming at in Europe. Well, thank you. I mean, you've raised lots of things that so go in many directions, but I know that one of the things you're advocating for is this global digital board. And are you imagining, I, I mean, I want to invite all of us to talk further about harms and also convergence, um, but are you imagining that that sort of body would be able to promote soft convergence or would just be able to uh, highlight I mean, we are, I, I think we're, if I may just be slightly provocative, I mean, we're, we're at a, a pretty low point in global cooperation <laughs> uh, 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 around legal frameworks, I would say. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think this is an area around which there's so much economic activity that there is momentum for action here. But I'm still puzzling on, on where that scope is uh, for cooperation. I'm, I'm wondering if you want to add a thought to that. Well, the, the times are indeed not uh, uh, for naive multilateralism. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I understand not, necess not in this country in particular, still today, which we, we thought would be different, uh, and things would have changed uh, in the last... Uh, Two, two years, uh, they, they don't seem to have. Uh, however, I think there, there must be realization uh, that because the economic agents we are talking about are global, if we do not come up with as global as possible responses, uh, we are gonna lose. And when I say we are going to lose, we as citizens, we as users, we as consumers. Mm -hmm. And this is simply not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think Joe and then Ron. Yeah. So, um, yeah, in the, fir the first thing is, is these platforms are different from other products in some ways because they are inherently global. Uh, you know, Google operates everywhere. But that's where I think that Europe will play a very important role because it's large and the platforms will have to adapt to the regulatory structure in Europe. And uh, when they do that, they, the cost of having two different systems will be quite great. So I think that there are at least one hope is that, that the economies of scale of having one system uh, mean that if Europe gets the right regulatory structure, then it will certainly impact the, reg the de facto regu uh, performance uh, in the United States and also affecting the discussion in the United States. Um, but I do think that there are so many differences that uh, an idea of people from the United States and Europe, let alone Africa and, and other countries getting together and agreeing uh, seems to me a little bit of a fantasy, and I think Rod has already mentioned several in, a, aspects of that. First of all, the interest in the political are very, very different, and you know. Secondly, a, as uh, Eleanor already pointed out, the antitrust laws uh, are very different. I mean, Bork uh, had a very negative, you know, the Chicago School had a very negative view. Uh, Eleanor referred to it as libertarian, but whatever you call it. Um, and our current Supreme Court is just moving in the wrong direction. So I, I you know, it, it's interesting to see the Biden administration attempt uh, to broaden antitrust um, to, you know, for instance, South Africa in their antitrust includes public interest. The neo-Brandeisian view is trying to broaden uh, from a narrow, very, very narrow uh, market-oriented, consumer-oriented view. But the Supreme Court is going, and the US Supreme Court is going exactly in the opposite direction. So um, as uh, thrilled as I am by the efforts of the Biden administration, I think without changing the Supreme Court, they are not going to go anywhere um, unless we get enough people in Congress to pass a new Sherman Act kind, kind of uh, Sherman Act. 
So um, in, in the deeper philosophical issues in terms of values, uh, I think that uh, Amer too many Americans are First Amendment absolutist. Even people who are very strong about First Amendment, like Lee Bollinger, have recognized that you have to shift with the change in the world that we have today. But the Republican Party hasn't, for the most part, uh, shifted. Uh, so I could go through each of the items that I described before, and I think that there's just uh, such a disparity in perspectives that I think uh, it is really a fantasy to think that we're going to be able to get convergence. Mm -hmm. So the most that we can uh, uh, think about is the I issue that you put, uh, Bruno, of coexistence. Um, and uh, there's one more thing that, that I should mention that I think is really dangerous is the imposition of single systems through trade agreements. That when nobody is looking, Congress isn't focusing on it, most people, the US has been adopting some trade agreements with digital provisions that I think may go run counter to what we would have if we had a good open discussion of digital governance. Oh, well that's an intriguing <laughs> thought. I might take you up on that one uh, a little I, bit. I thought you might. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, like no mandatory disclosure of source code. You wouldn't object to that, or would you? Um, I'm just trying to choose an outlier. Uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's embedded in, in, in a couple of, uh, or. Uh, you know, maintaining you no know, data localization. The, I mean, these are some of the principles that that the U.S. has been advocating in just a couple of trade agreements. Well, some of them, but I get, what I worry about is that there has not been an open discussion of digital governance, and it shouldn't begin in trade agreements. It should begin in a, 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 what is it that we want as a society, and then to try to use trade to say, where do we differ and how can we harmonize? But we haven't arrived at what is our digital governance. Europe is moving in the right direction. I think, you know, my sense is in some of the trade negotiations, say with Japan, uh, Google, the, the GAFA were very forceful and, and civil society's views were not adequately represented. Yeah, no, it's very in interesting. I, so again, it, there's a tension here um, uh, because so few dimensions of the digital economy actually, you know, have frameworks. We don't have a national privacy law. Europe does, right? We have several states that are developing some, and and that might be one of those areas you would expect. Now we could see some momentum around, but not yet. So, Rod, I know you have some specific views on this. Yeah, look, quite a few, but I'll make it sm small. Um, first of all, for Bruno, I mean, I do like the idea of the digital board. I think if we can get people talking, that's a good thing. But I have to say, when I think of convergence, I'm not thinking of the US, uh -huh. right? I mean, there's three regimes out there in the world. Mm. The first one was the Germans. Any German person... Uh, Bruno, are you German? No, thought not. Otherwise, you'd have mentioned 19A. So the Germans were the first um, uh, uh, who came up with a regime for regulating the platforms. And what they did is they just inserted into their uh, competition laws higher level extra principles that, that sort of fleshed out the, uh, the competition law. And then that just sits there and then they'll take cases under the competition law, but the competition law is strengthened. The DMA, which came second, is where you have those do's and don'ts, things you just can't do, and uh, that will give the European Commission enormous power uh, because where they find contraventions, um, they'll have very clear powers to take them, although the do's and don'ts are narrowly defined, so that may be a problem. Whereas the German things they've put in their, their legislation are very broad, which gives them much more discretion. And then the third one, of course, is actually the first one that came out of the blocks, which was the special market status regime in the United Kingdom. 
That came out following the F Furman report, 2019-2018, um, uh, a long time ago. It got lost in the Brexit confusion in the United Kingdom, like much else. Um, but it, it's a different regime. It, it's saying, let's take a company in a market and we will give them a, a set of conduct rules which will describe in quite precise ways what they can and can't do. Now, that's regulation. I mean, that is, by, you know, they're really trying to actually make the market. So you've got three very different regimes between Germany, the Europeans and the UK. I should say by way of disclosure, I've just signed on as a, an advisor to the UK under their special market status regime, but I haven't done anything yet. So um, uh, and the, scheme still, the scheme hopefully will become law in 2000 and, uh, later this year. So if you want to, for me, convergence is seeing how those three regimes work. They're very different in, in very clear ways and which one works and which one doesn't will be interesting to see. And yes, we've got the US cases but for the reasons uh, Eleanor and Joe have mentioned, I don't have great confidence, but fantastic if they did do things as well. Um, but actually, I think all this is a good thing. I mean, I'm not so hung up about convergence at the moment. I, I just think we have got such a problem with this whole issue that letting countries try things, some fail, some work, we can all watch and see what works, and then we can follow the ones that work best. And just a final word on the very important uh, Digital Services Act. Um, the Digital Markets Act is essentially competition, although European law allows them through their use of the term exploitation to get into consumer issues as well. But the Digital Services Act is, is, is largely about electronic safety, it's about um, uh, disinformation, and it, it's a first in the world I think it's going to get copied. It's fairly weak at the moment, but I think as it evolves, it'll strengthen. And what's interesting, going to the point you just made, Merritt, is in that provision, there is scope to look at the code, mm. the source code. Because if somebody is creating disinformation, creating harm, then I think my view is, but doesn't matter what I think, it's actually in the Act, in the Digital Services Act, that they are able to look into the source code and see what, what's generating that. Now, these harms are so large, I think that is just completely basic. So if you've got free trade agreements that says you can't do that, I'm mightily worried about that. OK. Uh, well, terrific. We could keep uh, going, speaking amongst ourselves, I think, very happily for quite a long time. But, uh, and, and it would be fascinating, I think. But uh, I think uh, we do also have many people here, so let us invite a few questions and see if that provokes us for further exchange amongst us. Um, there is a, a, I think this is being live streamed, and so. Um, uh, do you want to keep it here, or should I pass it out? Uh, what I, please feel free to pass it out, and we have a question right up front. If you don't mind, start here and then over there. Sure. Thank you. If you don't mind introducing yourself. Yes, I'm Latifa Harbash. I'm the uh, president of uh, the Moroccan Independent uh, uh, um, Regulatory uh, Authority for Audiovisual. And I'm also the president of the African Platform of Regulators. Uh, so uh, we all are in the digital age, uh, whether we wanted it or not. Uh, that means... Uh, uh, that uh, uh, there is, uh, the, the, the regulation should be a common good. Mm -hmm. uh, that means that uh, we have uh, to work uh, to um, create a new right, the right to the regulation, to the access to the regulation. Okay, but we don't understand in other parts of the world how to do that, how to uh, advocate for this because there are so many uh, disparities. Uh, we have the digital uh, gap already. Uh, we have many other gaps, but uh, we have now the, uh, the regulation gap and it's really uh, uh, dangerous for our humanity. Uh, I've heard uh, here that uh, regulation is about values. Uh, so let's talk 
let's, let's set up a real dialogue, an inclusive dialogue about values. Because we need uh, to build a new model of regulation that benefits to uh, all the humanity because we are in a global market, we are in global environment, digital environment, and the, uh, uh, the risks are global also. Um, we, it, it doesn't seem from other uh, uh, countries or from other parts of the world that it is always about values. Uh, we have some from, uh, we have funds from time to time. For example, when we see the French president uh, um, announcing that he will set up a taxation, um, the, the GAFA, and we had the response from the former um, American president. He said, so let's stop importing the French wine. <laughs> and after that, they, they have a solution. So where are the values here? Uh, last, uh, we know that data is really important for economy, and uh, this is the gold for economy, and uh, we, the, the EU uh, set up um, um, very early um, um, rules about this data, the FGDP, and we tried, for example, in Morocco, we adapted a law that it is really com com uh, compliant with this uh, European uh, um, directive. Now we heard that Europe is trying to uh, have a new law, the Data Act, uh, that in uh, forced uh, sh uh, data sharing and uh, stop a little bit the flow of data, but Americans are not okay with that. Once again, where are the values? Who, uh, for you. example, I read many uh, articles saying that this coming data act is a misguided policy because it will kill the economy. So where is the threat? Thank you very much. Well, I, I think you've, <coughs> you've, you've raised many issues. Uh, let, let me collect one or two other questions and then let our panel uh, respond. I, I think over here, I do want to make sure we have some of our students uh, asking a question or two. Hi, thank you for your insightful um, comments. I'm Lucia, I'm a second year MP student here at Columbia. Uh, so most of the arguments in favor of regulation of big tech are based on the market power of these companies and how they should be treated as essential facilities. We said we need to break up Facebook, Instagram, but then we see TikTok taking over the market and generating a huge competitive pressure over incumbents. Similar situation might be happening with Google <laughs> and ChatGPT. Do the, these new entrants and the new competitive dynamics that we are observing refute the need to control market power of big tech? Yeah, great question. I think it was on my list uh, behind you, uh, uh, which is, you know, are we fighting yesterday's fight? Uh, uh, and, and missing what's new uh, uh, is something also to think about. Uh, but let's add one more to this mix. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Jackson Dahlman. I'm a first year MPA student. And I wanted to hear some thoughts. There's been some debate about the harms we discussed today, competition, privacy, misinformation, about whether addressing one of those um, is maybe in tension with addressing another. So for example, um, in 2019, the Federal Trade Commission, where I used to work, sued Unroll Me, which was an app that promised that um, it would take all those subscription emails, well, marketing emails that you get in your Gmail, and combine them into one email so you wouldn't have to get so many. And we sued them for uh, being deceptive about what they did with the data. They said it would be private, they, aggregate, they sold the aggregated data to marketers. <laughs> And so, of course, we stopped that. But then after that, Gmail said that they would no longer allow third-party apps like that to use Gmail. So now only Google would have that data, and only Google could develop products off that data. <laughs> and more recently, we have seen uh, Google Chrome uh, block third-party uh, ad uh, tracking cookies on Chrome, and also Safari on iOS and uh, Mac OS. So. I'm just curious about um, if, uh, if you, uh, if panelists, see any tensions uh, in potentially you know, privacy versus competition or other harms, and if so, how do we balance, how do we find, how do we reconcile these tensions? 
Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let, let's let's invite the panel to engage which uh, dimension. Bruno, start us off. Yeah, per perhaps I'd like to address the first question uh, put by our Moroccan friend. You ask, Madame, whether uh, you know we shouldn't try to uh, uh, to spread the values, you know, to to, but but the values they they collective choices of communities, and. I don't think, I mean, it's clear that in a perfect world, I mean, coming from Europe, I would say, you know, our values are very strong. They're based on democracy, on the, the state of, of, you know, state of law, etc. Uh, but I know that this will be, will be complicated. So the, that's why, uh, and, and if you take, for instance, the, the, uh, the example of data, the, 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 the data are loaded very differently say, in Europe, in the United States, and in China. If I was to, to, to oversimplify, for us in Europe, data, it's about a personal identity. It's my privacy. You know, it belongs to me. You touch, you, 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 you hit my data, you, you hit me. I understand that in this country, data is still very much considered as a merchandise. And in China, data is an essential element of the control of the, by, the, by, the communist, uh, by the Chinese Communist Party over, over citizens. So it's clear that against that background, it, it's very complicated uh, to have uh, common rules. What we have to do is to see what we can do. And uh, somebody mentioned the, the difficulties, for instance, between the US and the EU. But we see that we can try to, to have adequacy regimes. And, and say, okay, your rules are not necessarily exactly the same, but let's try to see whether uh, whether uh, we, we can uh, try to live with uh, approximating uh, those those differences. Uh, and that's, by the way, how we, uh, uh, in, in great deal, we started to integrate uh, the uh, market in Europe, the single market, uh, by this uh, concept of uh, of approximation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Eleanor, can I prompt you on the question, maybe it wasn't what you wanted to answer, but, but I, you and I were debating between us the other day about whether there were technology-based developments that were creating new uh, competitors that was changing the nature of some of these problems. Do you have, do you have a perspective on that? Oh, uh, yes. I, it has been said that, and this usually on behalf of big tech, that look how competitive the market is getting and that the big tech firms are actually losing some money right now and maybe they're not as strong and as powerful. My own reaction is that's not a place that I think is useful and I'll tell you why. I think that of all of these systems, like Rod laid out three different systems, um, all in Europe, in which there is actually agreement that certain conduct should not be done. And it would be very useful to have statements and some consensus, even whether or not US goes along, that this certain conduct, like squashing people on your platform, should not be done. I think we need such formulation of rules, and sometimes it's rules and principles with a little bit of defense, but we need to come to some conclusion, and I think outside of US there's a lot of convergence, and South Africa's on board, and India's on board, in a sort of high principle way, that the set of do's and don'ts, or at least part of the set of do's and don'ts, are things that companies should not do because it's predatory conduct and it keeps them powerful. And if it's not the current GAFA, if somebody takes, nobody's going to take Google's place. If somebody takes Google's place, it should apply to that person too. Um, so I think, first of all, they do have the power, and I wouldn't discount it. And secondly, it doesn't matter if these particular companies or some of them are going to find themselves in some competition on some parameters of competition. Um, these concepts of what is bad behavior should be recognized. Joe, would you care to come up? Yeah. Uh, first, uh, let me say that I think the problems are going to get worse uh, because 
the market power of uh, Google and Facebook um, to engage in large language models and uh, um, the, no the amount of computing power and data that is used in these models gives them such a competitive advantage. And they seem to be uh, uh, so powerful that the problems uh, that we've had in the past, I think, are likely to be aggravated. I do want to comment a little bit. One thing, I was at a conference that uh, Eleanor uh, organized at NYU on, on competition. And one of the people in the audience has said, you know, you just get more relaxed. IBM was a dominant player for, you know, and eventually something, so, uh, IBM no longer is dominant. And uh, the answer obviously is, well, it was dominant for decades. And in that period of decades, a lot of damage could have been done mm -hmm. in terms of competition, in terms of innovation, and you just can't, and here we see it very visibly in terms of what they're doing. Their practices are so bad. So I think I want to uh, emphasize um, what uh, Eleanor just said: how important it is to have converging, so you might say, on objectives, mm -hmm. which are related to values. Mm -hmm. But then to recognize, even when we get convergence on that, there's a second level, is what is the best way to get those objectives? And uh, just to highlight what, what, what Eleanor said, Europe has done a pretty good job in the convergence on the objectives. And now the real question is, what is the best way to do it in the context of a sector that is very quickly evolving? And I think that is what, you know, if we're static, I think we could all write down the best way of doing it. But it's very quickly evolving. And part of the issue here is how do we respond uh, uh, quickly enough mm -hmm. to the changes? And I think uh, the real issue is the three interesting different models. And, and we'll see how it plays out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ron. Oh, just quickly, um, the question on privacy versus competition is an absolutely real issue. I think the that just brings back the point I made that we need to get integration between regulators within a country, so the privacy regulators, the competition regulators, and it may be that it's, it's uh, a sort of holistic solution, much like the special market status regime in the UK, I think we'll try and do, um, where you uh, come up with ways that deal with privacy and deal with competition at the same time. I mean, you might make data generally available, but make sure that it's uh, uh, depersonalised. Um, I think you can you can work your way through these issues if you get in, into enough detail, and I think we we need to bring the regulation down to enough detail so that it does that. Just a final comment about things evolving. Um, uh, as people know, I have a bit of an interest in the news media bargaining code, and of course we've got Chat GT, GBT coming along. Um, I think that's going to re enliven the bargaining code debate because Chat. GPT is going to be stealing media information and not compensating them for doing so. And uh, I think there's all sorts of issues with chat G GPT. I mean, a fantastic intervention is going to, uh, invention is going to do wonderful things, but uh, uh, I think it's going to cause us great harm unless we regulate it. And how do we do that? <laughs> oh, I think you've got to have issue Again, I think you've got to have laws in relation to disinformation. I think you've got to have laws in relation to payment for content, so you just can't steal things. Uh, I think you do it that way. I mean, you, the, the idea that you can let chat GTP, a GPT uh, uh, run uh, and do whatever it wants without laws dealing with uh, disinformation, without laws dealing with uh, um, uh, how you influence consumers, it just gets back to the whole regime. Can, can I just make one remark? And yeah. you, you know, I mentioned before that that every system has laws and regulation. One part of our legal framework is intellectual property. Who owns what? What? Oh yeah, knowledge. Yeah. And uh, how do you regulate the market for information and market for knowledge? And uh, what Australia did under Rob uh, was to recognize you're not going to really solve that problem under the standard intellectual property regime. Mm -hmm. And that was too complicated. Put it under into the competition regime and let people bargain for that information. Now that's gotten even more complicated. But you know what 
in a, in a way you could have dealt with it, you might have dealt with it within an intellectual property regime. It turned out that would have been administratively very difficult. And, and uh, I think it, it is another way that we might think about implementing oh, yeah. um, uh, some of what is going on. Well, just as a quick word, I mean, ChatGPT is going to unleash a massive number of copyright issues. So even if, if you don't regulate it, it's going to get hit with copyright issues left, right, and centre. So um, there's problems you're going to have to deal with either way. Since we have the benefit of, of Rod being here, could you share some lessons from your own experience in, in Australia and regulation? Oh, I think the main thing we've done, though, is the news media bargaining code, which is, um, uh, I guess, such a, a narrow issue in the context of what we're doing today. I'm not sure how there are many... Uh, lessons, but certainly um, uh, understanding a harm and thinking about it holistically and thinking about here's the harm, what's the right answer here, how do you go about that, rather than being bogged down in existing copyright law or existing antitrust law. I mean, we didn't use antitrust law, we just recommended, we, we could see that that wasn't going to work, we could see that it, copyright law wasn't going to work, so we recommended to the government that um, they changed the law. Now, um, because this was a law that was going to benefit media companies, as it happened, every media company in the country was in favour of it. And I had the delight of seeing um, the Guardian, which is quite strong in Australia, and the Murdoch Press, which is very strong in Australia as well, come together. The only thing they have ever agreed on, or will ever agree on, is the News Media Bargaining Code. That's it. Um, and they'll probably have the same agreement in the UK when it tries to do the same thing. Well, thank you very much. I think we're very short on time, but let me collect another question uh, in the back. Uh, uh, and we'll collect two and then have lightning rounds if this panel can imagine that. Hi, thank you so much for your interesting talk. Uh, my name is Miu and I'm an MPA student here at SIPA. I had a question for Professor Fox and a question for Mr. Um, sorry. Uh, Bruno. Bruno, okay. Bruno, sorry, thank you. Um, so for Professor Fox, you touched upon the new antitrust bills that were being that are being introduced in Congress right now, but I was just curious as to how you see their trajectory. I think you mentioned that you saw them being um, might be introduced in the next session, but I was just curious because they've been waiting for votes, I think, for a year now. And even though they seem to have bipartisan support, there's just been not a lot of movement going on. And so I was wondering, um, yeah, how you saw their trajectories going forward. And also on Bruno's point on international cooperation between like-minded countries like the US, um, EU, and Japan, I was just curious as to what your thoughts were on the G7 summit coming up um, forward. I think that setting standards for um, like data flows is a priority item, and if you had any expectations for results that you want to see. Yeah, thank you. I think we're, we're so short on time, we'll have to make that the last question, but uh, it, it actually is on the G7 agenda, of course. I'm sure that, that Bruno has views on that, and everyone on the panel does, so uh, why don't we start with Eleanor and come this way. Oh, okay. Um, in terms of the legislation in the United States, um, the one that has the most traction is one that actually sets forth, um, in effect, prohibitions that are very like the list in Europe, UK, um, and the German statute. Um, it does a bipartisan, bipartisan support, but probably not enough bipartisan support. And there's so many important things trying to get through Congress today. Um, I, I think the bill will be reintroduced. I think it's very unlikely it will go forward. There is very, very strong lobbying against it, as you would imagine. And Big Tech is putting in many, many millions of dollars to try to say that the bill is gonna put a chill on competition and make US less competitive. Um, and I think I'll, I'll save international competition because I don't want to talk too long again. So I will Thank pass you. it on. Just one word. Yeah, clearly uh, there are a number of initiatives going on. They're going on within the UN framework at the UNESCO level. 
uh, at the OECD. Just to talk about UNESCO, I recommend an excellent article uh, recently by uh, Professor Schifrin, uh, whom I can, I will talk under your control. Uh, basically, everybody agreed uh, in Paris of three weeks ago uh, that they disagreed on, on nearly everything. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is basically uh, what the situation is. I mean, there are some progress made. Uh, it's clear that uh, we can uh, perhaps hope that the, the concept of trusted data flows uh, can uh, currently being addressed by the G by the G7 and the, the Japan's uh, presidency uh, can move forward and will probably land in the OECD, but but uh, clearly this this enhances rather than uh, contradicts our, our recommendation uh, to have a, a multi-stakeholder body to address these issues. If I may, uh, Madam Chair, just one point uh, on on what Rod said. One of the difficulties that the regulators and the policymakers have in, in regulating the digital is that we're talking about things which evolve so fast mm -hmm. yes. uh, and regulators are not used to deal with, with moving targets. So that's why, for instance, we are being asked in our, in our think tank, it's, uh, uh, if we could uh, make proposals for the regulation of the metaverses. I mean, how do you uh, propose a serious and long-standing regulation for something the business model of which is not yet clear and is changing? So this is the challenge that regulators have to face, they, and that's why the, the concept of sandboxes and things like this are, are very, very useful. Uh, uh, I, I just wanted to, 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 uh, to underline that. Uh, just one, my, my final comment will just respond to that. I mean, I think that's where you've got to get back to principles and uh, you know the German law has things you can't do embedded in the Antitrust Act. Uh, Eleanor, I think, covered that very well. I think having general laws about disinformation, general laws about payment for content in certain situations, I think some of that can get ahead of some of those issues uh, rather than, uh, I mean, the very specific regulation, I agree, but I think there's a whole range of principles we could adopt which would get ahead of some of this technology. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, I agree with Rod. Let me put it in, a, in first a, a, a very big difference between this discussion and some discussions that were organized at CEPA about four years ago before the pandemic, where there was a lot of, uh, a number of people were in the view of self-regulation. Leave it to the, leave it to the, the, the representatives from, from Google and, mm -hmm. and Facebook said, leave it to us. You know, this is too complex. Uh, you can't understand it, just leave it to us. And, um, you know, it reminded me of the problems of self-regulation and banking. And the bank said exactly the same thing, leave it to us. Mm -hmm. And as an economist, one way of thinking about this is there are many cases where the pursuit of self-interest leads to the well-being of society. But this is an area where clearly it does not. And for a whole variety of reasons that we've already talked about, and with a lot of the consequences uh, that we've talked about. And so once you recognize that you know, the pursuit of profits here, for instance, involves engagement through enragement you know, and getting uh, uh, people excited, uh, it's about polarization, uh, it's about dividing our society, those are the things that generate profits but don't generate a well-functioning society. So in the end, I, I think, uh, just to echo what we said before, it's, it's a kind of, what Rog said, it's a, we have to work for a principle-based mm -hmm. regulation. And uh, with insiders, people of the regulator like we do in banking, sitting in the company and saying, here's the way, and constantly evaluating uh, what they are doing and saying, our, what you doing is what you're doing consistent with the principles that we've enunciated and testing the models. I mean, the interesting thing is when you go to a place like Facebook, and we were there in February, they don't know how these models are working. You ask them, do you discriminate? They say, we don't know. These are machines, algorithms. But you could test the algorithm. And having somebody inside mm -hmm. saying, well, we've tested it. You've given us how it works. We, you know, there are ways of doing it. Academics do it. They 
started doing it, academics started doing it, and then they say you can't have access to our data because it's giving the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, the framework towards which we will have to be working. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I mean, so, I think that's why uh, I personally appreciate very much we focus on what harms in what context because some of these harms actually, you, you know, they, they go beyond the platforms, right? And, and so when we talk about, you know, a global data regime, you know, that, that, that is really much broader than, than the platforms. And, uh, a, a, and I think that's what we're going to be talking about at the G20, uh, which is uh, Japan is advocating this notion of uh, data free flow with trust. Uh, now that, it's not embedded in a trade agreement, but it, it, it's a kind of concept they're trying to create some global norms around uh, with an organizational layer and a regulatory layer uh, and other features. So some are very particular. We've talked about very rich ones related to the platforms, and some are much broader, which I think uh, Bruno's work has revealed. So what a wonderful panel, and with great thanks to Columbia World Projects and also to Anya Shrispen, please join me in thanking our panel.